off, Stan. Thank you. Don't mind. Sorry to cut you off. That's all right. Janet's giving me the go ahead here. So, well, welcome everyone, and welcome back from Easter break. And hope everybody had a very happy Easter with your family. And okay. I'm a little tired today, honestly. <laughs> Mr. Bunny's hard job. Uh, Jennifer, you're going to get us started, I think. Yeah. Open and close, and it's all about you today. Oh, oh the flag salute. Sorry, I'm Sam. Whole flag salute. I guess I should look at my agenda. Sorry. <laughs> Daniel, could you make us please? Sure. Ready to salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> So, um, I, you each have a packet on your desk, there's a folder, and in the folder the top item that you have is the PowerPoint that I'll be going over, and then I'll, um, I'll point you to each individual document as we go through. The first thing I want to say is I want to thank um, everybody who contributed to this PowerPoint because it was a group effort, and so the programs who underwent the full program review this year, they, or in 2012, they provided input and um, information to me, and my, most of them are here today to answer any specific questions that we have, so I want to thank them for being here as well. So the first thing I want to talk about before we get into the, the next slide is the very first document that you have in your packet underneath the PowerPoint. If you guys hear me okay, my voice is kind of, I think, too much chocolate and Easter Bunny yesterday. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, a, and a thunderstorm that kept me up all night Saturday, right? <laughs> so, um, the first document is the rubric for evaluating institutional effectiveness, part one, program review. And I wanted just to review this with you because this is what the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges asks for institutions to be in compliance with regarding program review. And as you recall from our recent accreditation visit, Program review was not one of the areas that we were um, on warning for. It's one of our stronger areas. Um, yet, some of it's connected to planning and decision making. So, if you look at where we should be at the very minimum is in proficiency. So, if you look at the left side, there's awareness, development, proficiency, and then sustainable continuous quality pr improvement. If you look at proficiency, I, I think that we meet several of the characteristics for um, effective program review, the first one being that program review processes are in place and implemented regularly. The um, second one is, I'm going to go out of order here, but the third bullet point, the program review framework is established and implemented. The one, two, three, four, fifth bullet point, results of program review are clearly and consist consistently linked to institutional planning processes and resource allocation processes, and the college can demonstrate or provide specific evidence examples. And the last would be the institution evaluates the effectiveness of the program review processes. Those are all things that are very strong and in place for College of Sequoias. Two areas on the proficiency that I think we can improve on are the second bullet which shows that program reviews are integrated insti into institutional wide <coughs> for improvement and informed decision making. And that's some of the work that Dr. Conrad's helping us with now is getting that as part of our decision making and planning processes. And then the fourth bullet point, which is the dialogue about the results of all program reviews, is evident through the institution as part of discussion of institutional effectiveness. So those are the two that we are working on rapidly with Dr. Conrad. But the rest of the things, I think, we're really solid with program review and we have uh, in process. Where we want to be is the last box there, which is sustainable, continuous quality improvement. And I have no doubt through the next six months in the work that we're doing that we'll be there in the sustainable quality improvement. So that's the first thing is the recommendations from the um, program, from the ACCJC. The second item in your um, packet is the program review calendar. And so I just wanted to go over the process or the, the timeline with you. And as you can see at the top of the calendar, it's this one that's blue and yellow. It's um, every six years a program completes a comprehensive program review. And then annual updates are actually biannual, not biannual, but they're every other year. So we just should say every other year. <laughs> and so they're not actually annual updates, but they're every other year updates. Uh, but those are what our annual updates are. 
And only two of the three groups, either academic administration and student services, are in a comprehensive review in any one year. And if a program is to get a not satisfactory on their comprehensive um, it review, then they will be allowed to submit uh, uh, a program review in the following year to address the issues, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't change their timeline. So if you look at the timeline for 2012, there were five programs undergoing comprehensive review, and those are the five we'll be discussing today, nursing, social science, fiscal services, human resources, and foundation. And then the rest of those on the right-hand side, agriculture, fine arts, etc., those were the groups going undergoing the, um, the every two-year update. And that's a smaller update, uh, just an update, not a comprehensive review. And um, as you can see at the very bottom, the asterisk indicates that it's an academic program, the plus sign is a student services program, and the minus sign is administrative or interdisciplinary. So if you look over to 2013, the programs that are beginning to write their program reviews now are fire technology, language arts, math and engineering, science, academic senate, and computer services. So that's, and then it goes, the calendar goes through to 2017. So that's our calendar. Who will be up next? <laughs> Um, okay, so let me talk to you about what's in a program review. So the first thing is for academic programs, they're a little bit different model than what is in the administrative programs. So academic programs, the first section of their program review is the mission. And they talk about how is the mission connected to the COS mission, how is their program, what is their program mission, how do they evaluate their mission. The second thing they talk about is effectiveness. So how effective were they on previous plans? So if they said they were going to do something, how did it work out? How effective were they? For outcomes, they talk about student learning outcomes, program level outcomes, and institutional level outcomes. What are the outcomes for the different, um, for learning and for the different program uh, goals that they have? Instructional support services deals with any of the support services they provide for students. So for example, a lab or our math engineering science achievement program. Resources, they discuss human resources, physical resources, technology resources, and financial resources. And under leadership and government, <coughs> they uh, talk about um, how do they work together on outcomes, on assessing outcomes, on program review, on curriculum. So how do they work together? How does the leadership work within their program? And then finally, they have a program summary and a prioritization of their plans. In each of these areas, they, um, they have three sections. One is looking back, what have we done? What is taking stock, how effective was it? And then the third part is looking forward, what are our plans for the future? So they discuss that under each of those areas. Okay. For administrative programs, it's similar, but they talk about the mission and description of their program, and it's a program overview, and then the function. What is the function of their program and who they serve? Under effectiveness and efficiency, they talk about their goals and plans. Under institutional planning and outcomes, they talk about how their activities support the strategic plan. For leadership and governance, they talk about or decision making processes within their program. Again, in resources, they talk about human resources, physical, technolo technological, and financial. And then they give a program summary and prioritization of plans. And under each of these areas for both, there is a rubric, and they're given the rubric up front, and the rubric is what the Program Review Committee utilizes when they um, evaluate and, and rank or assess each of the program reviews. So, um, as I mentioned, the groups undergoing comprehensive program reviews this year were um, Nursing and Allied Health, social science, academic programs, fiscal services, human resources, and the foundation, which were the administrative programs. I also wanted to mention that the Institutional Planning and um, Institutional Program Review Committee is comprised of faculty and staff and administrators, and it's co-chaired, we met the co-chairs at our board retreat in January by um, Cindy Delane, our dean, and uh, Thea Trimble, who is our faculty in science. So they co-chair the committee and then the membership, is fa other faculty, staff, and administrators. For every program undergoing a comprehensive review, in January and February, they get an orientation to the comprehensive program review process. 
They are, have two workshops in spring that's a question and answer period. And then the co-chairs, Cindy and Thea, are available for any one-on-one -on -one sessions or meetings or anything that any of the <coughs> departments need. On September 1st, each program is, uh, is given an opportunity to submit a draft, and then the entire program review committee reviews it and reviews diff different ones, and then they give feedback and send back comments and suggestions on how they can improve the program review. And then the final draft is due, or the final version is due October 15th. So for this 2012 year, I'm at the wrong way, um, the results were that um, nursing and allied health received a proficient score, social sciences received a proficient score, physical services was excellent, human resources excellent, or satisfactory, excuse me, and foundation not satisfactory. And if you can, you probably can't read that at the bottom, but um, the academic, the three, the three ranges that you get for academic program is exemplary, proficient or insufficient, and for the administrative range, it's excellent, satisfactory, or not satisfactory. So those are the ratings. And I'm gonna go through each program briefly with you and highlight their prior year accomplishments, any major changes, and their prioritization for the future. Where does proficient come in? Um, proficient is under the academic, so it's exemplary, proficient, or insufficient. Okay, so proficient would be right in the middle, good job. Done. <laughs> you passed. Super. No, proficient's good. It's a good. So. Okay? Good. All right. So um, as I'm going through this, if you can, we're going to start with nursing and allied health. And so if you see the next document in your handout is um, their overall summary. So you have one of the things that we say we're going to do a program review is provide this summary to the board. So you're getting a copy of their summary, and I've summarized it for you. But this is the entire summary if you um, want to take some time to look at that. But um, the nursing and allied health for their prior year accomplishments, they, um, the physical therapy assistant program was awarded full accreditation. And they're, they had a 90% um, student success rate for, for the nursing and allied health division. So those were their two <coughs> accomplishments. And I've asked them, I asked them each to give me two to three highlights for the year. So we're gonna present that. And then two to three um, changes and then a list of their priorities for the future. So for nursing and allied health, they decreased enrollment from 60 students a semester to 40 students per semester. And they did a lot of research on that before that decision was made, but there were two major issues for, drop, for going down to 40 students per semester, mostly budgetary and then economic and employment options. They were finding that there aren't as many jobs for nurses out there right now, so they didn't feel it was fair to continue to graduate 60 nurses per year when they didn't have, there aren't jobs available for that many people. So the decision was made to go down to 40 students per semester. In addition, another major change is that they suspended two allied health programs, the healthcare interpreter and phlebotomy. And again, the healthcare interpreter was due to economic and employment options. There, they found that there weren't as many options out there for graduates of that program. And then for, for phlebotomy, it was budgetary, and also that's covered in a lot of the adult schools. So we felt that there were sufficient programs in the adult schools to cover that area. Yes? Did, did I just read uh, in the personal brief, wasn't there an article about healthcare translation for healthcare translation? So uh, maybe we've gone the other way now, and, and maybe we didn't think that. Or, uh, well, go ahead. Yeah. So some of those, um, the, the part of the problem is they hire them only part time, and I actually the reporter had called me for <coughs> an article, and when we initially started it up, it was the community came to us and said, "Hey, can you start this program?" And we looked into it. It sounded like a viable program, so we did, and we found after graduating, you know, a number of students, they were not getting the jobs, and the employers you know, told us, at least locally and within our district, that 
they were they were either training them themselves at this point or they were only going to hire them part time so it, it didn't seem like there was enough momentum at that time to continue the program i would think, and I read that same article, that it could very well change. It's all in place. We've only suspended it. So at any point in time, you can, you know, bring that back when necessary. Yeah, that would be a good article. Would you have to increase the number of students then? I beg your pardon? Would you have to increase the number of students? Depending if yeah, what the employment opportunities are. You know, we had a, approximately 30 in a class, and it takes uh, a, a year because it's 16 units to complete the program. We modeled it after San Francisco City College, who's had that program forever, very stellar um, program. And, you know, the so we could either keep it at 30 or decrease it or increase it depending on what the, you know, employment opportunities would be. So we can go either way with that. But when, it's there, it's just suspended, so we could always bring it back. But you haven't heard them locally that they want no. it again. No, okay. have not. Seems like you're on the front line. Have not. Yeah, no, have not. Sandy, do you think possibly because so many of them, we're getting more uh, Hispanics into the program, and let's face it, that's the interpreting language in this area. Do you think because many of them are bilingual that the doctors are using the nursing? the nurses for that? Well, according to their accreditation <laughs> agencies, they can't actually do that. Oh, okay. um, the, the person has to be a certified healthcare interpreter. It can, that's how they used to do it. They used to have sister interpret for the doctor to the mother, that's the patient. And that their accreditation bodies are not allowing them to do that anymore. That's why these programs are coming on board, but we'll see where, where that goes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy, for the answers. Okay, so the next part is the prioritization for the future for the nursing and allied health. And um, the first thing is that they met guidelines for several um, legis several issues in legislation. AB 1295 is um, requires that CSU will implement articulated nursing degree transfer pathways with the community colleges. And then SB 1440 is the Padilla Bill, which is requiring community colleges to work with the Cal State to develop transfer model curriculum. And then the QSEN is quality and safety education for nurses. And um, they were to develop competencies in knowledge, skills, and attitudes and pre in nursing pre licensure programs. So they've, they've accomplished, or that's one of their priorities for the future is accomplishing those things. Um, maintaining accreditation, and you know we were just uh, re accredited by the Board of Registered Nursing, so their next goal will be in fall 2017. Um, they're looking for additional uh, full time secretary position, um, implementation of case based instruction for the physical therapy program assistant program, uh, <coughs> training on the electronic medical record program. Uh, they want to develop a PT aid program for a short-term certificate, provide training for medium and high fidelity simulation mannequins, um, increase the student success rates in their EMT program, and the PTA faculty are evaluating their student learning outcomes. So there are their prioritization plans for the future. Okay, we'll stay there. Um, and then I'm going to point you back to your packet because the next item you have is the letter that the Institutional Program Review Committee sends to the division when they review their, or complete the review of their program review. So as you see, about midway down, the Nursing and Allied Health received proficient, and then they receive, they receive comments in the different areas. Exemplary, under the areas of mission effectiveness, outcomes, instructional support services, resources, and leadership and government, governance. And on the second page, they have areas for improvement in their next program review or in their updates. So um, under new and continuing altered plans, new plans to improve outcomes, new plans to improve instructional support services, and new plans to improve resources of all areas. So those are suggestions for them in their next um, their two-year review, okay? All right, I'm getting 
going to move on to the next one, which is the Social Sciences Division. And so, um, again, in your packet, the next item you have is the entire summary that we're, we are supposed to provide to the board for Social Sciences. This is just the summary pages of their document. And their prior year accomplishments is they put they implemented a, a prerequisite of English 251 for 36 of their courses. And so that ensured that students have proper preparation coming into the social science courses in writing and reading. Um, they also completed, we talked about that SB 1440, the Padilla Bill, they completed two new of the transfer model degrees in psychology and sociology. And then they offered 330 76 sections and 69 courses. For their changes since the last time, they eliminated 85 sections, but their enrollment increased by 5,000. So <coughs> that was in response to the budget of eliminating sections. And they had a full-time history professor retire. For their plans for the future, <coughs> they um, are pursuing full-time positions in the, those three areas, and they actually um, will be getting a political science position this year. That's the only one, right, Carol? Yeah, sure. Okay. And then um, they also are going to be working on those transfer model degrees in administration of justice, history, and political science. And I know they're almost done with those because they were just in my approval yeah. line. So I think those are almost done. Um, they want to increase the use of the Blackboard features. <coughs> They're looking at a social science research team to work on their assessments and outcomes. They are um, wanting all of their course outlines to include instructor feedback on writing. And they want to increase to 100% the use of the words outcomes in their syllabi. And then also they want to increase use of peer um, supplementar, supplemental instructors and that's a, a program we started about three years ago through our Title V grant that actually has students who have done well in the class sitting in the class the following year or the following semester and provide um, outside uh, kind of tutoring training sessions for the students who are in the class. So they want to increase the use of that. And then they want to increase um, 100 to 90% of their adjuncts participating in their student <coughs> outcomes discussions. Any questions on social sciences? Can you explain them already a little more in detail? Why yes, they so. They want okay, well, I can do my best to tell you, I'll let Carol finish. But uh, <coughs> we have, um, it's really because of our adjunct faculty pool are often coming from Fresno or from other schools and they're running back and forth to different schools, and we don't necessarily pay them for the work on assessments. We, um, it's difficult to get 100% participation. And we can't require them to do that. So in most cases, the adjuncts are more than willing to do it, and we're able to get them involved, and we encourage them to be involved. But I think it would be difficult to get 100% participation. Is that good answer, yeah, Carol? Yeah, we have <laughs> two different things we're focused on there. One is uh, participating in the assessment process, and some of it has to do with uh, people that are even in other states online courses or people that, uh, courses that are not te uh, being taught or are sporadically being taught mm -hmm. and then changes in staffing. So there's all kinds of things that come into that. And then the 80% is a different goal and that has to do with actually dialoguing with uh, adjunct and that problem. Uh, the problems that come up there are just scheduling. So we have the dialogue on, uh, like for example, I teach philosophy and our dialogues end up being uh, once a year on a Saturday <coughs> in because people's schedules just don't allow them to come at other times. And so our criminal justice uh, major, for example, has people that are working various um, hours of the day, so it's difficult to get all them together at any one time. Other questions on social sciences? Okay, and then I'll refer you back to your packet, and the next document you have is their letter, their response from the Program Review Committee, and they were proficient. They um, were exemplary in those four areas of mission and effectiveness, three areas in outcomes, and uh, two areas in instructional support, one in resources, two in leadership and governance, and two in, in their summary. 
And then if you can see um, under areas for improvement, they have two areas of recommendation on their new and continuing plans and their new and continuing plans for human and, and res physical resources and on their evaluation of the use of technology resources. The next um, group is the Fiscal Services Group. Oops. Okay, and so their prior year accomplishments were that they um, implemented one of our uh, administrative procedures, 5055, and they reduced um, accounts receivable for students from 47% to... Um, it re receivable by 47%, excuse me, from 3.4 million to 1.8 million. So that's a pretty good accomplishment, I think. <laughs> and um, how'd you and manage then, that? Pardon? Uh, how'd you manage that? <laughs> that was the new administrative policy that uh, said that all students have to have a zero balance before they can register or receive transcripts or any other type of services. And in the past, they used to be able to have like at least a hundred dollar balance. But we had many students that <coughs> added up to that $3.4 million. Just $1 million balance. So they want to come back and go to school. Now we have zero. Okay. Right. Yes. Right. okay, and they had a lot of staff participating in continuing education. I, in their document, they went to a lot of workshops, trainings, statewide trainings, and one, one person finished their master's degree and one person finished their bachelor's degree. So that was great. And Linda was the master's degree. <laughs> Congratulations. And then, and also they went, oh, sorry. What do you do with 1.8 million, right? We keep, no, we're we still keep, trying to collect that. Keep collecting it. <laughs> it went down to 1.8. It went from it's down to 1.8. <laughs> yeah, I understand that, but that's still a lot of money. I don't know yeah. I mean, that's we about, have, that's uh, about what our deficit is. We have a lot of it current. <laughs> a lot of it's current. Some of it we, we do write off for students. It always stays on a student's account, no matter what. But the auditors require a certain amount of bad debt to be written off each year. But there are some students that we cannot collect debt on if they go bank, you know, if they file bankruptcy or something like that. But we, we send students to COTOP every year. Uh, and that is if they file a tax return and they're going to get a state refund, st uh, the school gets the money. If they win any lottery winnings, <laughs> and then the last thing on their prior accomplishments was um, going live with Go Green initiative. And now, at this point, 75% of employees get their uh, direct deposit and their automatic slip. So, no, less paper. And they've done a lot of other things in that initiative to have less paper going on. Okay, and then their uh, major changes, they um, began implementing the banner, banner document management system and they are training and everything is in place. And that is an elect, really moves us from paper to electronic copies. And so they've been able to do a lot of things electronically now. And then um, they also brought in seasonal cashiers for the high, um, high times that they need assistance in that um, area. They did mention that they've had trouble building a pool of qualified applicants, but they were able to get the support they needed this year. Okay, and any questions? Okay, their prioritization for the future. Sorry, this is small, um, but on the first, on their um, cash flow obligations, they want to reduce uh, the need for borrowed cash by 10 to 15 percent, reducing expenditures by 10 to 15 percent. They plan to revamp the district chart of accounts so they can 100% accurately report the expenses and revenues for the different the district office and the three campuses. For the banner document management system program, they want to replace hard copy storage of their um, records by 75% with, with scanned records. For their payroll and mandatory reporting to CalSTRS, they want to be on time with zero late um, penalties for interest. And then they plan to reinstate a part-time to full-time to payroll. Um, and that is to help elimination of workarounds that aren't suitable. And uh, to help with the cross-training. So those are their prioritization plans for the features. Questions on fiscal services or for Linda? <laughs> 
Okay, and again, I'll point you to the next document that is their letter from the Institutional Program Review Committee. And as you can see, they had um, excellent rating in mission and description in four areas, effectiveness and efficiency in four areas, in all, it looks like all areas of resources, all of leadership and governments, or three of leadership and governments, and then the two program summary. And all of their areas were evaluated as satisfactory or excellent. So fantastic job from that department, and no recommendations for their two-year report. Okay. The next group is Human Resource Services. And again, you have their entire summary as the next document. In the, it's a, they have a thick one, 14 pages, so you can read that at your leisure. <laughs> um, they, uh, they, their prior year accomplishments is that they worked with all the entire campus to transition to our new health plans. They provided uh, ongoing training for management council, and they um, settled the three-year contract with CSEA. And, uh, major change, changes, they have now scanned all of our employee personnel files, so they're electronic, and they've reviewed and updated their HR forms. And in their priorities for the future, they want to have 100% online applications and also have an opportunity that they can interview out of area applicants via FaceTime or Skype so that we have that option if someone's out of the area, and to update and improve their website. Any questions for human resources? Okay. In your packet, the next thing is the human resources program review response. And they had excellent rating in two areas of the mission, one area of efficiency and effectiveness, Looks like most of the areas of resources, oh, half of the areas of resources, two in leadership and governance. And then they could improve in the following areas under resources, their um, obstacles and solutions and human resources, um, progress in implementing their achievement program plans and physical, the effectiveness in technology, the effectiveness in financial resources, and implementing or achieving their financial program plans. And then also their plan prioritization, bringing those forwards. And then also in the next part is making sure that their plans are measurable. So they'll be working on that for their two year review. Okay, and the next group is foundation. And so the next document in your handouts is the summary of the foundation's um, program review. And their prior year accomplishments were that they res uh, increased the amount of scholarships um, given by the foundation by $20,000. They um, provided some funding resources to the district for areas such as the Puente program, the Mesa program, and the Writing Center, and they revised their bylaws. The major changes, oh, I didn't have that up, I'm sorry. Here's the prior year accomplishments. And then the major changes is they reorganized the foundation board and then um, the scholarship program had gone to financial aid and it moved back to their administration. So the foundation is now administering scholarships again. So that happened during this last period. And their plan for the future is to get software for donors, I guess for donations, to increase the scholarships, to start a mini grant program where people could apply for funding from the foundation to increase marketing to high school students for scholarships and to improve the um, foundation website. Okay, and then the last document you have is the one from the Program Review Committee response to the, um, the foundation. And they had one area as excellent, which was description of the program. They were rated not satisfactory and they needed to improve in the areas of plans for their mission and description on the second page, development of efficiency goals, analysis of program achievement, description of technology resources, plans for financial resources, participation in leadership and governance, and plans for leadership and governance. Um, one of the required or requ uh, recommendations from the program review committee is that they submit a draft. I talked about the schedule and programs have a chance to submit a draft in September to get feedback. 
So they recommended that they do that in the future and to incorporate their goals and objectives into the document. And um, it's reviewing their, their, um, their report and also talking to the couple of members of the committee is really their themes did not match the criteria in the rubrics for each of the areas and they didn't provide enough information or an answer enough of the prompts and in the prompt there's the question if you don't answer if you don't read that prompt and answer that then that can result in you not doing well in that area so those are kind of two of the areas that the foundation <coughs> really was fully responding to the question Okay, that's the overview, and that are the five, those are the five <coughs> areas that underwent the comprehensive review. Um, so now we have time for questions, discussion, anything that I didn't address. I know it. I know at the retreat, I think maybe even at last year's retreat, I think there was, it seemed like there was talk about the program review process not, in some areas, not really questions that were being asked didn't relate, and so they're different by area. Is that something that's been changed or being worked on, and is that still an issue, or was it even one? Well, it's something that they changed. So they, okay. they consistently review their process, and so I think it was two years ago that that change was made, that they added, a, they made a different template for administrative programs, and so our student services areas and our administrative areas answer a different set of questions that's designed more for those areas than the academic. So, but one of the things that, you know, we've talked about a lot in the past few weeks, especially with Dr. Conrad, is that program review was the place that everything got dumped, basically, for lack of a better word. If we didn't have another way to measure something or assess something, everything got put into program review. And so our program review document is really full because it addresses many of the areas that we need to address for accreditation and for other areas. And so there's a lot that goes into it. And those are some of the things we're looking at as we go through this process over the next few months is how can some of those things be addressed in other areas or through our new planning models or through our new governance models, how may some of that weight be taken off the program review and the program review committee so that it's addressed in other areas through our governance and our planning models. Yeah, how, how would, I guess I'm, I'm thinking just out loud, you would think that this would be the place, though, because how do you assess, you know, in terms of what we're dealing with now with accreditation, where would you go back to see the warning sign? Would it be here, or what other place would those warning signs have appeared and been more obvious is my question. So I think this is one area, but part because of- Because if everybody's passing program review, yet we get sanctioned, so how does that work? And part of the issue, Lori, is that we, um, our, our, as I said, our program review is very comprehensive, it's very strong, but what we haven't done well, which is what we were on sanction for, is using what's in the program review to make decisions and using it in our planning processes. So we have a good program review, and we look at it for some resource allocation and things like that, but we don't have a, an ongoing dialogue about what's in program review, and we don't link it to our planning processes. So that's the thing we're working on now, is making that <coughs> and that dialogue and that assessment stronger. Can I add, Lori, I think the other thing you'll see in the um, <coughs> drafts that we're starting to develop now through the response task force for accreditation and through the subgroup and the work that they're doing in accreditation is that the planning model, for example, has all the elements of, of planning and, and um, resource allocation built into it and the decision-making model has all of the distribution of responsibilities and decision-making and how they work with time frames built into them. And each of those has a place in their respective cycles to stop and evaluate whether or not this cycle is working, whether or not this process is working. And in, in that planning model, program review is one element. But whether or not the results from program review are being used effectively when you move over to the participatory governance and the decision-making has to be evaluated in that governance and decision-making model, and we weren't doing that as effectively as we will in the future. So you'll see that in the in the drafts of the new <coughs> models that are being that are emerging now from the accreditation response task force. Uh, uh, I hear that the accreditation difficulties are failure to make this work. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, you know. 
short of a traffic cop that makes traffic do this, how does the process do this? Or do you need a traffic cop? I mean, how, how, does, how, how does it get implemented so it works? I think that the process itself is going to be the traffic cop. Right. Once it's working effectively, it has different stops. So you, you know, make your plan, you connect it back to the strategic plan, then you implement your plan, you assess your plan, you do an annual evaluation of your plan, and then it starts over. So the resources and funding will be based on the so, strength of your plan. So when this thing stops right here, how do you move it? I mean, that's right. The, the um, question you're asking, John, is the $64,000 question. <laughs> and, and the answer, what we're learning is that the answer is there are, that we can, to the best of our ability, build a plan that governs itself through its own elements of evaluation within that plan annually. But the bottom line is if it stops, the responsibility falls on your delegate, which is the superintendent president, to navigate that roadblock and begin the process moving again using the tools that are built into that model and that design. So I think we're going to see that more clearly codified now than we have in the past. And I think both administration, board, and faculty are going to be more clear on how those roles and responsibilities um, default if we get into those roadblocks. But if we do a good job on the process itself, there's points along the way in the process where, for example, the Academic Senate will do an annual review of their processes and report those to the District Governance Senate, which is what we now call our College Council. College Council will get an opportunity to hear what Senate's review of their annual work was, and then that Council needs to do a review of its own annual work and report it and share it with Senate. So that there's some checks and balances built in, and we haven't been doing that consistently as a system. So you just adopt some kind of a calendar with deadlines? That, yes. And then the integrity of the folks playing will make Yes, and what you described is exactly what we're doing. We're adopting a, a models that have a calendar and schedules built in with timelines, prescribed timelines for how things move through the system. So is our failure over the previous years failure, failure to have rigid time frames, rigid calendar dates, rigid deadlines? And, and, may, and maybe an understanding of the, the need for those timelines and deadlines and, and what happens if they're not met. So, so instead of this, we get this over here and this over here. Maybe. Or if something, if something was supposed to move like this and it kept going like that, it mm -hmm. could go off for infinity. So I was, I was talking with Greg a little bit before the meeting started. Um, and I don't by any means want this to be, um, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm trying to talk poorly of what's happened in the past. It's just a general assessment. But as a, as a board, we, were, we talked about achieving the dream, student success. Greg went to you know, seminars. <coughs> and, you know, I guess, personally, I'm not going to speak for the rest of my board members, but it seemed like we were doing that. Well, I think we were learning it, but we weren't doing it. And so now it's a little clearer to me what happened. And, and as a board, you know, we have to take some fault in some of the things that were missed. But in this process, it seems like, and I may be wrong here, but, you know, Bill was doing those things, but the processes we had didn't allow them to happen, because it sounds like we were getting reports that we knew this was coming, we knew it was important, we were doing, investing the money in it as a college, but we didn't get the results, and is all that work still being utilized somewhat, or was it something that got done and now that's been put aside and this is totally new? No, I don't, I don't think all of the work that was done, and there are staff here that actually did a lot of work, and they're more than welcome to speak. Yes, and that's why I, meant, I didn't want to talk to how many staff, because I know there's a process, and if it's broken, you can only do so much, but I guess explain to me how what we've done in the past is linked to what we're doing now, right. and I'm learned, I want to learn as a board member where, where were the things we were supposed to see that would have been our somewhat of a red flag, so. Right. I think the work that we did, that we have done on achieving the dream, on the student success task force, and those uh, activities that we embarked on are all interrelated, and they do very much overlap. So, the education that was that was garnered from faculty going out, the information that was being brought back and shared with faculty, was all good information. It was all valid information. It was intended, I think, to stimulate our thinking and stimulate our processes, our system, to, to kind of gently but 
persistently move us toward getting all of these appropriate changes made. And a lot of appropriate changes were made. Um, the, the, the infrastructure, these decision-making structures, these governance structures, these planning model structures that weren't solidified well enough were some of the most important but missing pieces in, in all of that education. Not to say that if Dr. Scroggins were not still here that those wouldn't have all been somehow fully implemented. But his absence along with um, the, the delegation of that to a group of folks in different corners of the campus to work on things and then no way to tie that all back together, no traffic cop to use John's metaphor, no traffic cop to pull that all back together and, and push it and ride it and, and help it be complete, I think left us in a, <coughs> in a fragile place, an un, unfinished status. And I don't know if there's something you could have been looking at as a board to show you that or to tell you that other than these kinds of reports um, where you're looking at program review and you're looking at individual departments' progress toward meeting these goals and, and our strategic plan and our master plan, all of which are going to go through significant revisions as we make our way through this accreditation process to get them to be more practical, more specific, more measurable. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, I think, and I, this may be asking way too much, I'm sure, but I think I, I, on a number of times, you know, how do we measure whether or not the money we spend on achieving the dream and the student success, success task force? Are, are our dollars being spent? And I, I find it frustrating that you can't measure, and that's just the way my mind works. But I just think as a college, it's important if we're going to spend money on programs like that, that we have something that we're going to get out of it at the end instead of just saying, let's go do this. And, you know, we know the college can be better for it, but we have to know what the end result is going to be. And I think a lot of that kind of went on, and I'm not saying it was all unproductive or unfruitful, but I can and I just, Lauren, the thing I would add is that the new processes that we're developing will do exactly that. So if Achieving the Dream came in this year, it would be, it would go through how is it related to our mission, how is it related to our strategic plan, and then, you know, should we then implement it. Once it's implemented, we have to assess it and we have to give an annual report on it. So we would know, we would close that loop on what happened with Achieving the Dream. There were six. Uh, recommendations out of achieving the, the dream project and all of them were implemented most of them were in student services so I know Francis's team uh, they implemented the or mandatory orientation the um, to, uh, electronic SCP yeah, <coughs> um, education plan. Um, student education, student education plans, plans. Um, and then there was the, the first first attendance. attendance there were six of them yeah. um, the uh, mandatory orientation the GIS that did get pulled that we were looking to require for all incoming students um, a, fr a freshman experience type of course. <coughs> um, but at that point, we were already on the downslide when we were cutting classes, so that got tabled. Right. Well, and none of those are related directly to you know accreditation and what we got but, called for, right? Because yeah, I don't want to make that together. But I think the important thing is that, that it, what um, Superintendent Carson so referred to is that with all of the, those were implemented, and they're working well, but what we don't do a good job is, because we work in those kind of silos, is reporting out, here are the results of achieving the dream, here's what's happening with mandatory orientation, here's what's happening with <coughs> student ed education plans. So that wasn't evident to our visiting team either, because we don't close that loop and report back on how well things have gone. In addition to that, that achieving the dream was a starting point for our strategic planning process. And so we, but we don't talk about that and we don't do a good job of linking those things. To the rest of the faculty. Exactly. Well, okay. tonight's, uh, tonight's study session is a good example of our new efforts. When you all, when we met in, this, in January for our retreat, and you as a board said, hey, we, we have been asking for the opportunity at least once a year to give a, an evaluative summary on the status of the divisions that went through program review. That's reporting back to the board. We, we tell you at the beginning of the year, here's the schedule of divisions going through program review. Here's the criteria that we're going to look at. We need to come back at this point in the year, sooner than this actually, and tell you, here's the program review process is complete. Here's how these divisions are doing. And then the work that we'll be doing from this point forward to continue to help them close the gap between where they are and the goals that they have set that align with the strategic plan. It's closing those loops that we, we're going to get a lot better at. 
And just from a board member's perspective, one of the things you might be thinking about in your mind is as we bring proposals to you going forward, knowing now what you know about needing to understand how this relates to our overall goals and objectives in the end, ask us those questions before you approve our initiative. Make us, I'm giving, I'm kind of giving myself more work here, but make us show you how does this tie to our strategic plan and if you're asking for this allocation of resources, what will we be able to see at the end and what's the reporting mechanism? How does this come back to us as a board so we can understand how this investment impacted our college? That's a great role. You should never feel bad asking that from us because that's what we should be providing for you in any proposal that you make. And the other thing we're addressing is the whole question you asked Lori about how making sure that our outcomes are measurable. How can we show you that it was successful? And so one of the people, uh, one of our consultants that's coming in on Friday is Dr. Bob Pacheco, and he's a researcher from Miracosta College, and that's his expertise. So he's gonna be meeting with the managers in the morning, the faculty in the afternoon, and then our part of our, uh, he'll be meeting with the entire accreditation response task force, and then with our subcommittee working on student learning outcomes to address exactly that. What is measurable? How do you make sure that you can measure the outcomes? And so everyone's going to get training on that on Friday, and that will help us with these different programs. And how are we going to be able to assess this? What can we show at the end that this was this was successful, and that it should either continue, be funded again, or you know, in some cases, and this is what our consultants have told us <coughs> is perfectly okay. But it didn't work out. That's okay if it didn't work out, but let's not just keep doing it if it didn't work out. Well, let's so know we why. Missed out. Also, let's understand yeah. why. Even if it doesn't yeah. work out, I guess exactly. I'm more so. Also, I'd like to know why, and maybe, and that's okay. They're not going to be successful right. at everything, but it's knowing why so you don't do it again. Exactly. Some other area. Or, so. Yeah. And so all of these processes get to help us get through it. Because when you go through what we've accomplished or what we're planning to do, you didn't see that. And I think that's the same thing the accreditation team was concerned about. For example, we put a prerequisite on 36 social science course, courses that you have to have completed English 251 prior to taking the course. And that was based on student success course data that said you're going to succeed in a class if you know how to read a textbook or you know how to write the language properly. So we, we, we put that on certain courses, not all courses in our division, based on research. And we have a, I don't know, it's about a 10 page study with several different statistical tests to determine which courses it should go on. And then we've also gotten a Title V uh, grant, I know Jessica Gallo's, I forget what it's called, just this semester. And it's a pilot project where we're going to get have our adjunct faculty participate in our division to do research to, to do things like to see, okay, we did put that prerequisite in place, is it effective? So we did a, a study prior to putting it on to determine which course, now we want to do another study to see whether or not it was effective. So a lot of the achieving the dream, another one is the transfer model curriculum, the uh, guaranteed transfer, that was part of those initiatives well, so we have two of those, and now our next question is, are they successful? So I think a lot of that's, you know, on the way, and it probably hasn't been pulled together through reporting mechanisms. I and mean, you would have never known from what you saw that all of that was related. It is written up in the interview, but it isn't drawn together in my budget. See, and one of the things, Carol, that would be really good, I think, is if, as we put together these ideas and proposals for the future, that we not only think about the data that we've studied to implement the change we want to we want to measure some causality on, but that we actually predetermine in the proposal, here's how we're going to measure it in the end. So so it isn't another, we don't have to think of what the next study will be to measure it in the end. If we know what we're intending to affect in the cause and effect relationship, we're going to implement, and then we're going to know exactly what data we want to look at to know whether or not it's had that effect. Yeah. It's all part of the package. We're doing that. It's For a board, I think that helps them feel good approving something because they know what that evaluation component of it is going to be. Well, they know how it's going to be measured. We're going to get the 90% and the 80%. <clears throat> we kind of do our best to judge. Like you said, why not 100%? You know, we'd be happy that we could make it. But we're going to have to judge it by the syllabus. which is one of the accreditation requirements, and you must have outcomes in your syllabi, 
Well, we realize that the students don't know it's an outcome if it's labeled an objective or a goal. And the instructors were, we were using interchangeably using these kinds of words. Mm -hmm. So we've had to change our measurement from, in fact, it went up to, I was really proud we had 82% uh, had some mention object, you know, of objectives, outcomes, or goals. Well, then it dawned on me that nobody knew whether those were outcomes or objectives or just somebody made it up. So now I'm being pretty literal in our measurement, and now it's down to 58%. <laughs> We've got to actually use the word outcome. So students across the board come to a class and go, well, there's the outcome. Because one of the questions, does the student know the outcome? Well, if they don't know that your objective is an outcome, they'll say, no, it's not there. You know, so we have to change language. That's right. Yeah, it's just that's right. They're being asked a question that they really don't understand, right. <laughs> which is real critical when yeah. it's being asked by the crediting team. Yeah. 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 Well, Laura, you'll go ahead and you'll go next. Sure. I have a But I guess my uh, community members have come to me and said, how in the world can you allow this to happen? And, uh, uh, and I, you know, I guess I want to know how much or how should the board get involved to know that it doesn't happen when, you, when you're asking the question, six years ago we had this problem, yeah, everything's fine, we've got the letters, we've done the letters, we've done all of this, and then uh, this time around, we were told everything looks good, everything looks good, and then we get the worst possible write-up that we can get. How, how does a board member, uh, or how much do you get involved? I, mean, I don't know. I, I just don't know how a board yeah. is supposed to do that. I, I think it will, part of what you're grasping for, Greg, will be what will be explained to us from a couple of the representatives from the ACCJC <coughs> when we go to this workshop. But it does require, as, as boards, it does require you to have a, a pretty good understanding of the overall accreditation process and then the board's role in the accreditation process, which isn't to get down into the blades of grass and try to micromanage the statistics and the data and the checkpoints and play traffic cop and all of that, but it's to have an expectation that you get, um, that you get regular reports in some sort of a cycle, regular reports from your staff and your administration on the progress, and that you understand whether or not that progress is substantive or not. And so there's some materials that we're going to get when we go to this training, and it's your little guide, it's the elected official's guide to monitoring the implementation of accreditation, and it's going to give you a chance to ask us those questions along the way if we're not addressing them in those updates to you. If I'm bringing you a report, and it's sounding flowery and looking good and we have a fabulous PowerPoint, but you can glance down at your little table and realize that I didn't hit a couple of those substantive issues, you should be asking us right then and there, there's some checkpoints here that I don't think I saw there. Can you help me a little bit? And honestly, if we're doing our job, you'll be able to sit back and feel fully satisfied with the depth of coverage that we're getting. That we're giving. But you do have to have those tools to check. And just to add on, I'll send you a link to there's two documents that the, that the Accrediting Commission has on their website, and one you'll, I'm sure, be getting at the retreat, but I can send it to you in advance, which is the what the Board of Trustees needs to know about accreditation. And then there's a section on the board that what are, you know, that they go through on the self-evaluation. <coughs> so I can send you both of those. But part of the other issue is exactly what Stan referred to, is that accreditation has to become a way of life at CLS. So at every board meeting, whether it's accreditation year or not, we should be giving you some update on accreditation. It needs to be a constant dialogue. Yeah, 
out to six in the credit commission is something unusual. They took the whole board into an executive session and went away. And they asked us what's wrong with this college. We all gave answers. You know. And uh, they said very nice that you're all wrong. And what they said to us was, is, is, there's no communication. There's, there's people that talk to each other. There's, there's no unity in the way things work. Well, from that, we saw an improvement in this college for this, this circle to actually get work. Now, the board wasn't in that circle. They were kind of off the side. Too bad we weren't in it. But we, it, it still went like this, even though we weren't in it too much. It good. Well, uh, a couple of years ago, this thing went boom. And then it skipped, and then it go clunk. And, 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 and so I think Lori and the fact girl could see it. It just didn't do this anymore. So if I'm on the right track, uh, fast forward two years from now, as long as this thing's doing this, and we're in it, and we'll know that it's, it's working. And if it doesn't do this, if it hangs up, <coughs> just goes out like this, uh, or we don't know what the hell they're doing, I guess uh, my question 2018 is going to be the same thing. My question to you is that if you if you recognized that we had clunks, why didn't we step in and do something? Well, if you remember, we uh, needed about four and a half million dollars, Greg. Well, you also <laughs> you, you also you remember. Think you think it was a money issue? <laughs> well, no, it was more than that. It well, was, I think it was because I, I didn't want we got rid of that for it. No, 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 no. no. You no money drives the money drives you. You asked your question. I haven't been able to answer yet. Okay. Is 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 I think there was a recognition, but just a disagreement about how to go about how to go about dealing with it. And, and, and I have to admit that I didn't, I couldn't understand what had happened well enough to express myself until more recently when somebody explained it to me better. But we, I saw it, Lori saw it, didn't know what to do about it. Uh, uh, and uh, I think Earl probably saw it too, although I didn't talk to Earl about it much. It, it just it, we didn't. I didn't know expect it. Never expect it to go college. But I expected to get wackies and bad in 2012 and 2006 because it didn't do this anymore. And uh, 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 so uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and you know, it, 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 it's a, it, strong leadership, was diff which is different than strong cop. Strong leadership.
I was a little uncomfortable with how the numbers were being assessed because once we could get on the same page, they may be hard decisions, but we all agree it's a decision that has to be made, not one that maybe didn't have to be because you thought this and we thought this. And I think as a college, we need to have some trust and work and, and grant. I, 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 I'm 100% confident has the ability that we can all be transparent with the budget, that we all understand it in the same way so when we come to make these decisions, it doesn't stop the wheel. So I do think the budget has a lot to do with it. And I don't know if anybody else feels that way. But well, I do if, if, if that's an else, that's all you pay attention to and everything else. And if you ignore, that's no good either. If you ignore right. this thing, right. well then. Yeah, having been here for every single president that COS has ever had from Crookshanks on, um, I would just say that that wheel has never worked. It's worked with the personality of the presidents. And it hasn't had, there hasn't been a map, or there hasn't been um, a plan, a system, thank you. So, Crookshanks, very, very charismatic guy, got tons of things done, beloved president. Um, Lincoln Hall, not so much, but in my mind, one of the better presidents that we've ever had. And one of the things that um, Eva Conrad said the other day was, if somebody comes in here, if Stan is not here, I assume Stan will be here, and tries to tell you to change your plan one more time, don't let them. So one of the major problems we've had is, I mean, Bill had brilliant ideas, and we bought into them. Achieving the Dream was one of them. The first California community college to be part of Achieving the Dream, maybe Gates money at the end of the rainbow. I mean, we were, we were there. Uh, but did that go through a process? You're completely right, Lori. That went through no process. That just came to us. And but because the process wasn't working, <coughs> you can't blame Bill. You know, that's why the process is so important well, to yes, work, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and if you if you had asked me what we were going to get dinged on, and, you know, I kind of looked over everything, and I would have said, well, it's got to be SLOs because we're behind. We're behind and they're not in the system correctly. So the student learning outcomes can hurt us. If you had told me that we would be on show cause due to our planning, I would have laughed. Because I would have said, well, we have a fabulous program with you. What do you mean? The, the fact is, we don't know what that looks like. We, we have no clue what it looks like. And we are just starting to see a glimmer of it. And it's very exciting. I mean, if, if you could run a college and it didn't, and it wasn't based on the personality of, of the person in charge, I would say, yay, that's great. And it wouldn't be what the faculty said or wouldn't be what the administration said, but as John was pointing out, it would be the communication uh, among all of us that did it. I think we're on the cusp of something really wonderful. Uh, but I don't think any of us have seen it working, aside from maybe a few years when the money was good and we were all happy and we all got along. But that is not a process. That is not a system. That's just a series of fortunate events. So, I, I really think that this came at the right time, actually, even though it's very painful. The IC back to kind of... Well, I mean, yeah, one, of the, one of the <laughs> things is that I, th I think out. that uh, Jennifer commented on it. I, I think the big, and John, you did as well. The biggest thing is we do things, but we do them in isolation. We have a committee over here that's doing great work. We've got committees over there that are doing great work. We've got committees back there that are doing great work. They never talk to each other. Never. Never. You can't get anything done. You can't show those connections. You can't evaluate anything if you don't talk to each other. And that's what we have never done. Never. Um, and I think, that, I think that we have the potential here if we get our processes right. But the problem is that our processes have been historically very weak whether it's been the Senate, the College Council, or whatever, it tends to be personality driven. And it's not just College Council, it's not the board, it, it's across the board. It's every committee tends to be personality driven. When you change the people, they change their rules. And every time you change the rules, then there's less communication. Because no one knows who we're supposed to talk to. 
because that personality is gone now. And um, I think that if we don't make our processes really strong and get real transparency across all of them, we'll, we'll be back here. I mean, I'm telling you, we will be back here. They just summed it up. No, no, I, 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 I agree. I think that was a great, between the two of you, I mean, and what Stan said, all of that goes together. Could some of it be, too, you have leaders that that's how they control? I don't know if it's control. I think it's different leaders have different style. Um, and it's how they, it's how they act <coughs> in their leadership roles. Um, I mean, there's always a, there's always a kind of a cynical view, I guess, on every perspective. But I think in our case, at least in the last six years that I could look at, I think Thea said it very nicely, and Michelle has commented, we were, we were personality driven in how things were communicated, and how deals were brokered, and how decisions were made, and the structures were there, but the structures weren't there with real substantive purpose as much as they were there because they had to be there, but I'm going to make sure through the personalities and the relationships that we use the structures to get done what we need to get done, as opposed to the structures actually being the driving force. So when one personality exits and another one comes in, the structure's still going. Like Michelle said, we don't want somebody to come in. We want to give them the manual that says, here's how we're structured at College of the Sequoias. The new president, join us. This is what you're becoming a part of. Not bring your own manual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's what I think is exciting. As hard as it is, I think that's what ex is exciting because for those of us who are starting to understand that, mm -hmm. we're putting those building blocks in place, and we're, we're this isn't a, we're not building this place from the ground up. It's a wonderful institution, but we're doing a great remodel on this thing. Yeah, it's going to be really nice. I think when we're finished. I think. One of the things coming from a vocational background, I think too many times the academic side of our campus looks down upon the vocational people. And I see this not particularly here, but I, I think it exists. And I would say probably as far as student outcomes, if you look at the vocational classes, you'll probably find they have a better way of measuring it than anyone. And I think that the academic part of the campus needs to listen to the vocational part of the campus a little bit more carefully and see what they are doing. And I have talked to the vocational people and some of them say, I give up. I've tried to have input, and no one wants to listen. Well, that's, I think that's completely consistent with what Michelle and Peter said. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? I'm just thinking about, uh, uh, and here mentioning uh, Dr. Conrad and Dr. Jake Wills, consultants that come in and look at this thing. And I think about the fact that. Uh, the, the state requires us to have an independent financial audit you know, on an annual basis, which we do. You know, and, and I think it may be uh, uh, at the, uh, the proactive and maybe that uh, Dr. Conrad or you know, somebody like that, or Jaco, you know, to help the student process beforehand as opposed to afterwards and all the whole, you know, again, get back to the question we saw it coming kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe, maybe having somebody come from the outside and giving the input, sometimes it's uh, easier for those that are in, maybe not making the processes work to be able to see that well, uh, from the independent source. Without the intimidation of accreditation. Ken, let me try to understand you better. Are you talking about help changing the college and the way they communicate, or are you talking about how to prepare a uh, well, you know, maybe a little. I think they go hand in hand. You know, maybe both. Well, I'm not so sure. You know, the, the accreditation thing is reporting what you got. So if well, you somebody got the takes, mess, then it shows. Yeah, if somebody takes a look. I mean, beforehand, if yeah, somebody I mean, you're talking about evaluating the process. If somebody takes a look at what you got, say, you know, you're not going to make it. This isn't working. You got, you know, the, uh, you need to do something to to, to make the process work. 
What's up? When Stan made that presentation at Room 350 last week, he talked about how many people are serving on accreditation team and said one. He was wrong. He was two. Yeah. And uh, I was the other one. It's amazing. You go to a college you've never been to, never been to, read what they wrote, and honest to God, in about an hour and a half, you can tell where they're coming from. And uh, I'm sure they have us. And, uh, 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 we want to, I've already encouraged you all to sign up and do that once. It's, uh, it, it's, it's not that you learn so much about other college. It's uh, uh, what you do. But what you, what you learn, you learn all about yourself. You suddenly realize that, that, that I don't care what you write in reports or what you say, when strangers come in and look at you, they can tell what you really are. Good discussion. There you Anybody go. else have any comments? If this is really good discussion, I encourage you to don't hold back. That's a small room, but well, I feel like I should have held back a bit there, Ken. I didn't mean to criticize your conclusion. I was hoping that you were emphasizing that people like that to help us become a community college as opposed to somebody to help us save our work. Well, maybe I can yeah. express it. Yeah. Good. Anyway, so. You know, I don't know if you're ready to wrap it up, but uh, I didn't know uh, if we should have discussed the foundation's not satisfactory a little more than we did. You know. Well, and I, and I guess it has the recommendations in there, but I, I think if you want to expand on those, that would probably be helpful. Okay. And I, and I can help with you. Yeah, well, if you look at there, um, if you go back to the last two documents in, the, um, in your handout, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one of the things, so I can find it, what uh, the top of it is, uh, oh gosh, six program summary and prioritization of plans. But it doesn't. It says COS Foundation in the second paragraph. Yeah, that'll be. We'll and then the last one is the. It's one of the. It's the document, the program review Their letter response. Letter. The letter. Letter. It's the same one-two package you got for each of the divisions. It's, it's, it's the last one. But it'll be the final one, and it'll have the foundation in the first paragraph, and then the letter that they got from the program review committee. So, and I'll let Stan uh, talk about it as much as he wants, but I reviewed it today, and what I noticed, and then I called Cindy, who's the co-chair, and what I, I kind of just reviewed it with her, although it's been a while since she reviewed it, or since they did their, their review of it, there, were, there was a lot of information missing. And so, there wasn't good, there wasn't good responses to the question and then a lot of missing space. So if you look at your the program summary and prioritization of plans, look at page two. This is the prioritizations of their report. This is a separate <coughs> section that they get evaluated on. There's a rubric that's on page three that they get evaluated on. But as you see in number two, they did not fill any of that out. It says not applicable. These plans are in other sections of the report. Well, that's not answering this question. And I noticed things like that throughout the report that they, they just didn't respond. So if you look just at this summary, they didn't respond to over half of the summary. And so that gives them, and you know, if you look at the rubric, that would give them a not satisfactory <coughs> on this section alone. But, but my question would be, why didn't they respond? Was it because, because uh, I, I'm, I'm, I sat on that board, is it because not enough uh, time to do this type of report because I think it's just one person in the, in, in the director or whatever in the foundation. I, I'm, I'm wondering if that's part of the problem. There's just not enough time and to do it all. I'll let you answer, but I think one of the issues, but the other issue is, as you see in the letter, they didn't go through all of the training that was provided to them. They didn't attend maybe some of the workshops and they didn't submit a draft which everyone can do to get feedback, really good feedback. They had opportunities to meet with Sydney and Theo one-on-one, -on -one, and they had opportunities to submit a draft to get feedback on it. My question is, is it because they don't have enough time? I'll let Stan respond yeah. to that. No, I mean, they're, they no. have No, yeah, the question, yeah. They, 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 they have the ability to prioritize their time for the duties and responsibilities related to their job. And doing your, doing your comprehensive
maintenance of program review is a significant responsibility, Greg. And what Jennifer pointed out is that um, over time, if, if you, I'll, let me say it this way, if you procrastinate, this process can overwhelm you. But well, the way it's been designed is to have some opportunities for meetings and training the year before you go into your comprehensive review. And then an opportunity to get one-on-one -on -one support through workshops that the Program Review Committee provides. And then the opportunity to write a draft and get feedback so that you can revise your draft before you turn in your final product. But all, in order to take advantage of all of those things on the prescribed timeline, you need, to some, you need to start early and do it a little bit at a time and build it into your work schedule so that you have time. If you wait until two days before it's due or two months before it's due, you're going to be overwhelmed. And so it really was, I, I take responsibility being the administrator who the foundation staff reports directly to. Um, and that's exactly what we have built in for correction in the next cycle. For example, Jennifer said that they have the opportunity to submit a draft again in September. You're given the chance to go back and, and correct all the things that weren't completed and provide that information back in. So we'll be doing that. I don't think this one, I know there's a lot of areas where they fall a little short on time to meet the rushes and the peaks and valleys of their schedule. This area wasn't one of those. We just didn't do it sequentially enough because we weren't organized enough early to take responsibility for it. And we will be doing that. We will, we will. You either didn't have buy-in or didn't. Well, and remember, this is really, this is primarily for the foundation staff right. to work no, on. I mean, what they would be doing with the executive board is they would be putting this process on the executive board meeting agendas over the course of a year. So five or six times you're talking to the board about this in little pieces and then culminating at the end. Okay, we just so, as get a, organized. so as a board member, I need to be insisting that that stuff is coming. Well, you need to know that you're in your comprehensive program review this year, and you need to ask what are the what are the agenda items we're going to be receiving as a board to make sure that we meet our program review requirements. Okay. Okay. You know what, Greg? I, an example of this is the ag the ag department did not pass their site right, a couple of years ago, and and so the question kind of came up, but it was never really brought to the ag advisory committee. And then a lot of it was because I think it just didn't get completed, um, and so. I guess that's why these processes are so important. It's a fact, not an opinion. It either got done or it didn't, and there are reasons why. It doesn't have to be somebody's opinion. It doesn't matter who the people are. It's not personality driven. You're, you have to do a lot. It doesn't matter if you like your division chair or you don't, or you're busy, or, you know, like Stan said, there's a whole year, and that's why these processes are so important. And that program review never got back to the Ag Advisory, which really needs to use it because it needs to be part of it. Right. And those processes make programs stronger, and, and it's not a way of, it's just, it's it could be positive criticism, not and constructive, not bashing. And I think it's it's how, it's how you look at it, and how you use it, and they need to be used for the right reasons. But you know, I, we used to have the division chairs come give the program reviews, and that worked for a couple of years, and it was nice because even when they didn't pass, they didn't like it, but they got they, they had to ask, we got to ask them questions, which I think is okay. It's good. Um, if you don't pass your program review, you know, somebody, and there may be lots of reasons, or there may, but if there's red flags, the board's going to see them. I'll put it that way. So I kind of did like that as a board member, and I don't know if everybody else did, but we got to see the division chair, you got to see who was doing the majority of the work, and they got to defend, or not defend their case, but they got to lay out the facts themselves. Present. Present. And explain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turf work will always result in the best 
comments? Anybody else? We're good. No, I just really want to thank everybody who did their program reviews and showed up today to support and who participated, contributed to the PowerPoint and everything because we did a lot of work and I really appreciate everybody who's here. Laura, are you going to do public comment? Yeah. Do we have any public comments? I would like to make a public comment about uh, <laughs> <laughs> do I do that? No, wait a minute. <laughs> you're, not, you're not the public. Okay, well, what, I mean, my agenda. what I want to talk about is uh, the COS Golf uh, Committee. Oh, sure. Make an announcement? Yeah, the oh, okay. COS Golf uh, Tournament uh, is coming up on the uh, 29th. And we've made a few changes. We're going to six-man teams instead of uh, four. Six-person teams. <laughs> Instead of four, we're only uh, you're going to be using a total of you have to have a minimum of 75 strokes, one player seven or less, and uh, you only have to use one tee shot. So it's, we're, we really want it to be a lot of fun. I think we already have 15 uh, teams of uh, 10 to 15 teams committed already to the tournament. Uh, we should our goal is to have over 100 players. We're we're already talking about cutting it off. <coughs> at 18 teams because we don't want it to last too long. I mean, that's kind of exciting to think that you're going from 40 players to over 100 players <coughs> this year. And um, so if you've got some teams, you want to put some teams together, it's $900 for a team. If you sign up individually, it's uh, $175. So, so that's what happened. We put you in charge, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I hope my mouth. If you don't golf, is there anything else you can do? Absolutely. <laughs> Well, you know, I had a, had a meeting with uh, Stan. We, he was talking at one of my groups the other day, and, and he said, I really want you to pull this thing off. He said, the timing may not be good, but I think the timing's great. And it'll be an opportunity to get these community people out there that are very involved in the community. And Stan and uh, Brent Calvin are going to be out there talking to the people, talking about what's going on, and I think it'll, I think it'll be outstanding. Right. So, we, we saw it as an opportunity to help help educate our supporters about what we're doing on the accreditation. And right. Answering questions is another way to shake hands and be out there with, with people. And, and what I found when I'm asked these people to get get me six people together, get a team in here, boy, they're ready. They're ready to do it. So we may have to cut it off uh, because we That's may great. have to get these people to get in. Anyway, we'll get in. So. Okay. okay. Any other comments? Can, can I ask a question of Stan? Well, I was just wondering why my brother-in-law in Sacramento got one. Was this a letter? Was this a letter? The letter that you sent out about the accreditation. You know what? You know who the audience was for those, Earl? I'll tell you why they may have received one. That was a letter specifically from the foundation to everybody in the last five years who's made any kind of a donation to College of the Sequoias. That actually came as a recommendation from our Community Advisory Committee. They wanted us to have a letter from the President go to all of our donors so that people supporting the Foundation knew the status of accreditation. Because they might be in Sacramento just reading the newspaper, and they might not be willing to send their donations in if they think we're in trouble. So it was letters to our donors. Any, any other questions or public comment? Remarks. Thank you, everybody.